Black Ops 2 Zombies is a bit of an odd duck. On one hand it has its own application on PC, which felt like another show of confidence in Activision, whereas before it was in the base application. On the other hand, the UI infrastructure is a mess. Previously you selected which map you wanted to play through a menu, and there was nothing wrong with that. Black Ops 2 has a globe, which does look cool, but navigating it is frustratingly difficult on a mouse. And the nail in the coffin, it's a constantly online mode, even solo, which might not sound too bad since if you're playing on PC you're more than likely to be running Steam, but that means if the server shuts down, Black Ops 2 Zombies will be inaccessible. In addition, a huge drawback is that even solo play is treated like a lobby. This will be important when I get into the DLC maps. Black Ops 2 technically arrived with four maps, each of them distinct in one way or another. The green one had bus depot, farm, town, and a mode called transit that linked these maps together, and then some, via a bus. The first one we'll cover is Bus Depot, the smallest and most simplistic of the lot. No traps, no switches, no perks, just you in Hell's interpretation of a Bus Depot with a random box. It's a bit like Knacked Down Totem, except two areas instead of three, less clutter, and is surprisingly entertaining. It's very simplistic in the right way, and it's a good way to introduce people to the mode. You've got the very basics here, from the zombie entrances to the mystery box's primary function. I was also introduced to the fire zombies, which occur temporarily after they step on one of the hell cracks on the floor. The flavour text of the game says it's a masochistic stream, but to be honest it really isn't. Doesn't detract it from being a good map to spend 20 minutes in though, and it's made me think that if Nacked Dare Untoten was originally given the go ahead and the budget to flesh out the mode, that this would have been the map they made. Next up is Farm, a little bit bigger and again it only has two sections, but with the addition of the original four perca colas from Verrucked. And once again the map is surprisingly entertaining. It's a little bit more difficult since jumping off certain points of escape can possibly lead you into a bathtub full of zombies below, but as a basic map it's pretty challenging if simple. At this point of research I thought I was playing some type of tutorial to the mode. Not only were both these maps going to be used in trans it, but it felt like a natural learning curve. Start small, then add some elements. And the culmination of that accidental tutorial is the town, which is also surprisingly entertaining. It's decently sized, the Pack-a-Punch wonderfully presents itself as something difficult but attainable in a very simple way, and it introduces the players to how the mystery box works. Stamina Up makes its appearance, but PhD Flopper doesn't. In fact, you're not going to see the PhD flopper machine in a functional form ever again, which marks a weird change in the mode by permanently removing something that, by then, had long been established. Unlike the others, this map can start out painfully slow, and that's because the starting area is the biggest starting area in the entire mode. Zombies can come from anywhere, but they walk towards you incredibly slowly, so it does take some time for the session to pick up. Some general design advice when you design a horde mode like this. Don't make your starting area big, because the first round's conclusion will likely be a long, drawn out process in finding where the last enemy is. Make it small with a few entrance points, not a sprawling epic. Finally there's Transit, which is sort of like the main event of the shipped mode. It's those three previous maps dropped into one bigger map, and they are connected by other locations, like the diner, power station, and tunnel. They are directly connected by a bus that'll leave the area after a set period of time, or shortly after you hop on it yourself. It's a clever idea, which makes this map arguably the biggest zombies map at this point, and it's certainly packed with content. I love this Hellfire aesthetic that makes this map visually distinct, a key strength of the mode's individual levels, and it's hilarious seeing the zombies run after the bus. There's also a new key mechanic that'll play out in future maps called Buildables, and I think it's pretty cool. The problem with levels like Moon is that picking up objects and interacting with the environment felt very specific to easter eggs and nothing else, but here? It's a core mechanic. The first thing you build is a portable power conductor that'll open entrances and can even power up the Perca-Cola machines. That is neat. 
which is a shame that transits the mode, has a number of little niggles that make it less enjoyable than I wanted it to be. The buildables are a neat idea, and I do like the power generator, but you can only build certain objects on certain benches. So, if you grab something intended to be built on one bench but end up at another, the game will just tell you to go elsewhere. Sometimes the materials are difficult to find. An example is the power switch. You have to build it before you activate it, and you think you might have done it after getting the panel and the switch itself completed? But there's one more object to find, and that is a specific zombie hand somewhere. So you'll run around hugging every surface imaginable trying to find it, since it is in the vicinity. Somewhere. There's also the Pack-A-Punch machine. Every previous map including a Pack-A-Punch, with the exception being Kino and Call of the Dead, have made an effort to show that it is out of reach in the beginning, but visibly obtainable later. Shangri-La had it at the top of a staircase, Moon had you spawn next to it, and Green Run's own town had it in the starting area, in the middle of a pool of lava. But Transit moved it to somewhere else nearby. It's in the bank, but you have to open the vault doors via grenades. Then you discover that you need to activate power elsewhere. Unless you want to risk getting attacked by little critters constantly, you'll have to pop on the bus and get back to the power station, which takes some time because that location was to stop directly before the town. You place a power generator in front of this door, back on the bus, back to the bank, and you discover that you need to build it. I get that Pack-A-Punch machines normally require a challenge or errand to be completed, but how are you supposed to know this without a guide? There's also the Electricity Man, who ends up being more annoying than challenging. He continuously zaps you, and can travel on the bus, constantly zapping you. I discovered later on said bus that knifing it is the only real way you can defeat it, but it doesn't excuse its being annoying over its being challenging. And finally, the bus itself. The concept is a good idea, and it was a highly entertaining feature. In co-op, the solo experience feels very different, and the bus becomes more of a liability in later rounds as the zombie health ramps up. It's still an entertaining map solo, but it's one of those maps where it feels like there's something missing without other people around. In fact, the new perk in this game, Tombstone, doesn't appear in the solo experience. I still enjoyed my time on this cool mode, but I had a hard time calling it more entertaining than the snippets of the map I played before it. There's also another system introduced, banking, but I hardly used it on this map. But it is a mechanic I will show a weakness for very soon. And that was it, that was the end of my zombies experience outside of Shadows of Evil. I didn't buy the DLC or the season pass for this game, but not because of some hatred towards the series, to the developers, or to Activision. It's because they were coming out during a busy time in my academic life, and I had no time to dedicate to them. I didn't see the community grow or react to new releases. I just stopped paying attention to them and focused on getting my studies completed. However, with the announcement of Black Ops 4 and a good amount of money to waste, I did eventually buy the DLC. Unfortunately, without console commands, my job got a bit harder, and the custom game option in Zombies is a lie. The only option there is, is difficulty selection. You can pick easy or original, no variants, which is a shame since Black Ops 3 would turn into a feature-packed epic that I believe hasn't been matched by any other game in the series. I'm going in blind now, guys. Pray for me. Okay, I really like Zombies mode and a good portion of the maps, but I hate Nuketown Zombies. And not in a Shangri-La way where it's just dull, I mean, I loathe this map with almost every inch of my being. And no, it's not because it's Nuketown, which is arguably my least favourite multiplayer map in history, alongside Snowbound. It's because it's an unenjoyable, unfun zone born from a map that wasn't designed for zombies. The map came with a season pass and is technically the first DLC map, but it's hard to count it as such since it was only available from the season pass. It's just zombies in Nuketown with most of the routes cut off, and the only way to get from the central pass to behind the houses is through said houses. 
perks come down at random from the sky, meaning you could wait for ages for a juggernog, but receive the pack-a-punch first. Which is what happened to me. You'll know when one is coming when the siren starts playing. I did like the random perk spawn in Shinonuma, but the difference was that any time factor involved in getting them was all on me, and not on a time of the game set in the background. The map is a big nothing, it's just a repurposed map for marketing purposes, and it doesn't have any gimmicks other than said meteor colas. There's nothing truly special about this map other than… well, it's Nuketown. Why is there some sort of iconic status for Nuketown that it keeps getting dropped on us every Black Ops game? I hated Nuketown! Just a giant grenade spam fest on domination and broken spawn points so you could suddenly get ambushed from behind. Jesus Christ, I hated this! Okay, calm, 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 calm. Treyarch, I love you guys, but please do not do something like this again. Please. My favourite film of all time is Dread. It's a simple story with arguably the best execution I have ever seen, both creatively and in how Dread does his job. After watching this film twice in cinemas, I took the logical step and consumed as much Judge Dread media I could find. Democracy, Apocalypse War, pretty much most major events in the fictional universe. One of these stories was Day of Chaos, which involves a deadly virus akin to 28 Days Later's Rage Virus spreading throughout the populace, before dying out several days later. It's not the first time Judge Dredd has taken on a mindless infection that controls the host, and it's got me thinking. Is there any zombie apocalypse media that takes place inside a tower block? The closest I could find is George Romero's Land of the Dead and the aforementioned 28 Days Later, but tower blocks and the living dead aren't really things you see often, and you could do some really cool stuff with that setup. Explore social conflicts and psychological effects that result in being confined to a limited space. But it's not, and it's a real shame. If someone does have a piece of good zombie media set in a tower block, please send it my way, but it's clear that Treyarch saw some potential in such a setting. The result is Die Rise. Yeah, that's totally not a confusing name. A map that had a lot of potential, but was bogged down, again, by several niggles including something that destroyed all challenge. But first, the stuff I liked. The aesthetic is outstanding, again making this map distinct in both look and feel. Treyarch said each of their maps should feel different, and that philosophy has not left them. I especially love that you enter a section of the map that is upside down, caused by the supposed collapse of the opposite tower. Even the random box is upside down, and I find that really adorable. Each section of the map feels very distinct in colour and architecture, and although I raise some issues with one section later, I appreciate the efforts that has gone into it. One is a bright haven, another is a grimy sweatshop, and the upside down section caused a lot of mess. There's an emphasis on constant motion in this one, with no area having open herding areas, but not too narrow to make it impossible to traverse through a crowd of zombies. You feel like there's more chances to escape. The lifts introduced in 5 have been repurposed into something you can use and need to pay attention to. They present neat challenges in terms of colas, with some of them randomising their positions, but they're not too far away to make tracking them down tedious. Their movement and position also allows the player to do some clever traversing, giving them the opportunity to access late game areas or bypass several doors. There's also a new perk, Who's Who? which gives you the opportunity to revive yourself and save your perks if you go down, although your apparition also distracts zombies, so its usefulness will depend on what type of person you are and what playstyle you pick. Remember the monkeys in Ascension? You know, the worst part of that map? They're sort of back, but redesigned significantly. They don't go after perk machines, but instead come after you, but they jump around all over the place, making them a challenge to take down. However, they are much larger than their previous incarnation, so even though they jump around like crazy, it's still likely your shots are going to hit them. All sounds fine and dandy, but then the little things start creeping in to take the wind out of the map's sails. You might have noticed that the footage I am showing you is missing the all-important Quick Revive, which has long been essential for the player to survive the solo experience. The machine, 
does not exist in the spawn room, but it wasn't until much later when I realised that you can get it early on. You see, normally every Perca-Cola machine in the game requires the power to be turned on to be available, but when Black Ops repurposed the Quick Revive to be suitable for single player, it became the only machine that would be turned on at the start. Kino, Five, Ascension, Romero, Shang, Moon, The Green Run, even Nuketown had the machine available at the start. The exceptions to that were Moon, where you simply have to get on the teleporter to transport you to the machine, which is hardly a caveat, and Nuketown, where you had to wait for the machine to become available via the first meteor. In Die Rise, and I found out about this much later in my playthrough, you have to unlock the first door to access it, but since it's the only elevator that's active at the start, it means you have to wait until the lift comes up before you can purchase it. There are keys to fast track elevators, but they are at the bottom of the map that admittedly you can quickly get to, but then you can't get back up to Quick Revive until much, much later. As for that fast track elevator I've just mentioned, that leads me to the journey to the electrical switch. So, there are two different pathways you can take. One will take you towards the random box and eventually the switch, with a lot of doors in between if you land a jump horribly. Or, you can descend quickly and only have to unlock one door to access it. Sounds obvious, right? Big problem. Unless you purchase a weapon before descending at the start, you're going to have a hard time because the pistol is the only weapon you'll have access to if you decide to immediately jump for the switch. Nothing on the walls upon landing, nothing in the switch room. Speaking of that section, the design is some of the worst I have seen in zombies. Guys, if you are designing a zombies map, here's a tip. A choke point can present a challenge, a narrow corridor can present a challenge, but if you design a room that's nothing but narrow corridors and turning, you'll be really pushing it for calling it a well-designed area. It actually disorients me a lot, that section, because I'm continuously turning to the point that I lose track of which way I am facing. So I died, quite a lot, and bloody hell does Black Ops 2's biggest weakness show due to it. I've mentioned before that Black Ops 2 Zombies is online only, even for solo players, but the game treats every session like it's a multiplayer lobby. You wait to be counted down into the game, cutscene, play game, and eventually die. In World at War and Black Ops 1, dying simply resets the game back to round 1. Black Ops 2 doesn't have that luxury, so when you die, you are placed back into the lobby, regardless if you want it to be or not. There's not even an option to reset the session in the pause menu, because even though you selected the solo option in the zombies menu, every game is technically a multiplayer game. Treyarch, I don't care if your animated cutscene is a well-polished treat. If I have to start watching it for the sixth time in an hour, I'm going to start looking for a way to destroy it, even if it takes out my screen too. Like I said, I was going in blind, I didn't know the layout or quirks, and so I died aplenty. Also, the game continues with something I really don't like, and that is its vagueness to certain mechanics. I briefly touched upon banking, and I completely forgot about the weapon storage feature that I rediscovered completely by accident. It returns here for the purpose of breaking the flow. First off, you store points in the showers, which, considering their location in a sweatshop floor, baffles me that they didn't opt for even a domestic safe. There's also nothing signpost in it except for a little twinkle that you might possibly mistake as a leak and shower at a glance. I know this was a feature added in a patch, but you could have placed a small safe on a pre-existing table in the corner. Here's the thing about the banking and weapon storage. Whatever you put there is stored inside across sessions. Let's say I deposited a few thousand points in the shower, then died. Those points will still be in that shower until I pick them up in a different solo session for a 10% fee. Or when the server dies. Its purpose and its location practically invites people to try and break the game, and bafflingly, it's an acceptable tactic for speedrunners. That trip to the power switch I mentioned earlier, guess what's on the way to that switch? The weapon locker and the shower bank. I guess there's a lesson there in which you work hard to make the future much easier for you, but Zombies has not been about cheating with the mechanics, it's always been about accuracy and strategy. And 
There's another thing. Buildables are back, but the only one you'll take notice of is the Sliquifier, which is, no joke, the most overpowered gun in the entire series. You build it using materials nearby, and if you fire it on the floor, it makes the surface slippery for both you and the zombies. Makes for some chuckling slapstick comedy. Until you realise there's a second function. If you fire it at a zombie, it will explode. If there's another zombie nearby when it explodes, they too will blow up, and pass it along if another zombie is nearby. This means you can wipe out an entire platoon of zombies with one bullet if you play your cards right, and there's an achievement if you successfully completed a chain of five. So that's got me thinking. There's an elevator shaft you enter when you descend in the upside down section, and there's these extremely small rooms that offshoot from it with a light incline. There's only two ways zombies can get in, and I thought I would put the Sliquifier to the test. Surely Treyarch would have anticipated something like this. Surely they wouldn't have made surviving the map get turned into something akin to a cow clicker, I thought. My previous record on Zombie Solo was about 35 rounds, and after starting this little experiment... Well... I later discovered that this was the speedrunning tactic, but the fact that it was so easy to find speaks volumes about unchecked power creep. Was it unintentional? Likely, but even without the absurd outcome, Die Rise has too many little design problems that prevent it from ascending to greatness. Ah well, at least I'll have over 200,000 points waiting for me should I return. On the other hand, prisons are much more visible in zombie media, thanks in part of it being the primary setting for two seasons of The Walking Dead. And what is the most famous prison in the world? Alcatraz, of course, and thus we have the primary setting of Mob of the Dead, though given a drastic makeover. From the intro film, you can tell that it's going to be a very different zombies map, and not in terms of tone, I mean on a more fundamental level. It's got a classic gangster film feel, suitable since you are playing as a classic gangster, and during the action, it plays Johnny Cash's Rusty Cage. You know, as much as I love the new Prey, I am a bit sad that we didn't get that Bounty Hunter-esque game as originally advertised. About five years ago, I went to Minecon in Paris, and I came across a producer called Mark Morris. He was the producer on a game called Prison Architect, and I asked him what the inspiration behind the game was. He told me that in some instances, designing a prison level is more fun than playing the level itself, and that the designer, Chris DeLay, took a trip to Alcatraz itself. He returned home to tell his team that a four-year project they were working on should be put on hold in favour of Prison Architect. I say this now because the sheer amount of detail, from the visuals to the zombies to the architecture, showcases arguably Treyarch's best work at the time, and could only come from a passionate team working on something they love. Mob of the Dead feels huge. I wouldn't be surprised if it was the biggest map of the mode out of the ones I've played. The prison cells, the executive offices, the underground sections, and the docks finally balances bigness and density. As a fan of the architecture of prisons, I had a blast going through each of these sections and figuring out the layouts, and what I found is that there isn't really a good hoarding spot. Die Rise had this too, and it managed to balance that out with corridors of appropriate width. Mob of the Dead has that too, only it doesn't have the dreadful lower floors problem. And a bit like Die Rise, you might have noticed that there isn't the site of Quick Revive in my HUD. The reason why is that there is no Quick Revive. At all. Anywhere. Treyarch decided to cut the fat, see what was working, refine that, and adjust what wasn't working. You have Double Tap, Juggernog, and Speed Cola, the usual suspects, and you have the Deadshot Daiquiri introduced in Call of the Dead. Alongside those, you have one new perk. 
Electric Cherry, which creates a shockwave around the player when they reload, with the effect being more deadly the less bullets you had left in your magazine. I didn't really use it, but it was clear that it was made to partially compensate for the lack of mule kick. There's also an emphasis on signposting in terms of objectives and puzzle solving, which leads me into why Quick Revive is no longer there. If you die or knock yourself out via a faulty power terminal placed around the prison, you'll enter the afterlife, and you take on a spiritual form who can run faster, power several devices, overload selected terminals, and even zap away zombies elsewhere. The caveat is that you have a time limit in that realm, and if you don't revive yourself, you will die and end the game. This is something on the surface that I should hate, but in reality I found it pretty cool. This realm is a core mechanic not only for survival, but in exploration, and it's nicely balanced for single player. You first learn about this realm and its unique properties almost immediately, since you start in that realm and there's a power switch to zap right next to you. Simple, ingenious tutorial. From there, you'll get a maximum of three chances to go to the afterlife, whether it be by your own design or because of zombies, but you can gain one extra chance for every round you complete. This will make you pay attention to the environment, since you'll now be looking for ways to maximise your time in the afterlife. Also, if you enter it by choice and have perks, you keep those perks, but you'll lose them if you get kicked down by zombies. There's also another gimmick enemy, but he doesn't have his own special round, he just pops in alongside the regular zombies. He can be tough to kill, and he can lock down perk machines and your homemade plane, which leads me to two huge gripes I have. Even though I am currently going through these maps practically blind, I do have some criteria I want to meet before considering my time on the map done. One, I want to spend a few hours on each of these maps. Two, I want to explore as much as I can. And three, I want to get to the Pack-a-Punch machine. So, in this map, the Pack-a-Punch machine is directly tied to the main quest line, but unlike Moon, the objectives are very simple gather things to build the plane, and in order to gather things, you need the Warden Key, which is nearby. Moon was really obscure in its objectives, but Mob of the Dead does it wonderfully, because the objects themselves are very easy to find thanks to some clever level design. The elevator demands a code, but the power switch is at the top of the shaft. Going from the latter to the former will showcase what you need to punch in. Objects just need some light puzzle solving that's quite easy, and some just require the key to unlock. If you have a hard time finding them, don't worry, because they all have a bright, easy to spot green aura. The exception is the prison clothes, but they were also easy to spot thanks to level design. I knew the washing machine was important, since it was connected to the power node on the other side of a locked gate. Those clothes are the best and worst part of this map. You see, when you activate the washing machine, the room is sealed off and zombies start pouring in, which means if you go after these clothes in a later round, start praying, because you are not allowed out of the room, and the shower is an extremely difficult room to survive in. The road to the Pack-a-Punch machine is nicely thought out and easy to understand. It's just completing it solo is a stressful experience. It took me hours to finally complete it, because the afterlife is such a double-edged sword. The throwing axe you can get for feeding these dogs does help to some degree, but doing it solo requires some meticulous planning. When you go down, you enter afterlife, but if you're in a late round or have a ton of zombies to kill, they have a habit on gathering around you like they're trying to give you a group hug. If you zap them, it'll feel like they're literally just around the corner, waiting for you. Even though you have a maximum of three lives, you'll blitz through them in under a minute at some point. Ironically, the easy option available in custom games is actually harder, because while zombies are easier to kill, you only get one afterlife, because even though you are on your own, the game treats custom games as a multiplayer lobby. But I trudged through, and I did it. I built the plane, launched, and immediately crashed into the Golden Gate Bridge. Pack-a-punch right there. When you return to Alcatraz and you want to get back to the Pack-a-Punch machine, you go to the same places and pick up fuel instead of completing puzzles. 
Christ, it was exhausting. Mob of the Dead is fun. It's good, possibly great on solo, but it's hard to ignore the exhaustion I felt in trying to get to the Pack-a-Punch machine. It's a damn fine map made out of love, but I do wish there was more refinement with the plane building. Reaching it was an achievement for me, but I wish it was a less stressful experience. Western Zombies, surprisingly, had already been used to great effect in video games. 2010's Red Dead Redemption was a fantastic game, and for some reason the very personal story of John Marsden facing the people he once called family got a zombie-focused expansion. Undead Nightmare is considered one of the best DLCs ever made, that nicely accommodates one of the best games ever made. It's a pretty high bar set for zombie cowboys, and although Buried is nowhere near the quality of Undead Nightmare, it's still a damn good map that feels like a series finale in a way, considering where we're going to next. The map begins awesomely, with you in a flimsy building baited to take higher ground, before falling into the earth, never to return. Great start! The key gimmick is that in certain areas, you can place weapon markers on the walls, so long as you have the chalk for it. It's introduced upon arrival in the same wonderfully subtle ways the afterlife is introduced. From there, the entire town is your oyster, but one element you are also introduced to is what I like to call the big friendly giant. If you free him and give him moonshine, he'll charge in one direction and potentially cause desirable property damage. Again, nice and simple introduction, and the moonshine is going to be in obvious places, either the jail cell you find the BFG in, or the saloon. I just love this setting and its layout, it's unlike anything I've seen before. You have your main floor with the buildings, but like Die Rise, you can bypass some of the blockables price tags by taking advantage of the map's unique layout and features. Most of the time, you can enter a building via the BFG, or hardcore parkour. There are also tunnels that run along most of the map, and while buildables are back, the materials for a non-quest buildable are normally fairly close together. I found the materials for the trample steam inside one little shop. There's also a new drink, Vulture Aid, and structurally it works in the same way as PhD Flopper, in that seemingly unrelated things are spliced together. But unlike PhD Flopper, the benefits from drinking it are actually useful. You can see the locations of perks, weapons, and the random box nearby, zombies will drop small amounts of ammo and points, which is really useful, and most notably, zombies will emit a green mist. Kill them, stand in the mist, and the zombies will run away from you for a time. It's really useful, and it's the key to lasting into the round 20s. It feels a lot simpler in execution, and I'm not too sure why it feels that way. Might be because there's no gimmick rounds, and the general layout is something that is very, very easy to remember, akin to the zombie maps in World at War. So, what are my problems? Let's start with this house. I know zombies were originally an offshoot of the horror genre, but was there really any need to have this spooky lady fly towards you? I love horror, don't get me wrong, but when a map has this neat western setting with giants and modern day guns, especially with this cool soundtrack, the last thing I wanted was a quick insert of the woman in black in the middle of Abraham Lincoln vs Zombies. And it gets worse. Every time she lands a hit on you, you lose 2,000 points, which is completely crippling since you have to go through her to get to the Pack-a-Punch machine. There's something about that little mixture that stresses and freaks me out, but thankfully once you finish upgrading your weapons, you don't need to go back inside except for one more time. Oh, and if you need any advice about this place, enter it when the lights are on. Going through it and killing the last of the ghosts will get you a free perk, even if you already have four equipped. I was able to get every single perk just by this method, so if you lose points, at least you get something out of this horrifying experience. And speaking of the Pack-a-Punch, normally you're handed a challenge in order to access it, and the challenge here is relatively simple. Use the BFG to enter the front lawn, go through the mansion, and then you're forced into a hedge maze. 
Look, I'm one of those guys that's got lost in the hedge maze in the original Tomb Raider, and at 25 years old, I'm still not good at mazes. There isn't much room to dodge zombies, and if you're running away from them and hit a dead end, goodbye, thanks for saving up all those points, idiot. And speaking of points-based issues, the bank is back. Fortunately, it does take a little bit of effort to get to, but then you start realising that the banks in Green Run and Die Rise are of the same franchise, so you know that 200,000 plus points I deposited earlier, it's all available to collect here, so challenge in terms of points has gone out the window. Fortunately, you do need to do some work to get the Juggernog perk, and unlock the most useful of shortcuts with the BFG, but it's hardly an achievement when you can comfortably unlock an admittedly less intuitive path on points alone. I got key perks, all the doors unlocked, and weapons upgraded in the first round because of that bank, and I'm fairly certain there's some sort of challenge out there that has you do it without killing a single zombie. Do you know what I miss? Aside from actual challenge, I miss the afterlife mechanic, and it's thematically suitable to use here, since you're going after ghosts in spooky mansions. But Buried isn't a follow-on from Mob of the Dead, it's a follow-on from Die Rise. Did I enjoy this map? Yeah, I did. A lot, actually. It's toyed with placing your own weapon chalk that I thought was done quite well, and the Pack-a-Punch is relatively straightforward to get to when you've figured out the maze and get past the spooky woman. Grievances aside, it was most certainly a net positive experience, possibly the best map in Black Ops 2. I might return to it again, and my thousands of points will most certainly be waiting there for me. Remember that time the internet blew up about Battlefield 1 being in World War 1? Remember how the entire world railed against Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, even though the biggest crime committed was releasing a crap trailer? I remember those days. It was a rough time. And what got lost in the shuffle was that three years prior, Call of Duty had a piece of World War 1 in its zombie mode. And I say peace because it's hard to call it a World War I map when it includes giant robots, zombie paladins, a bit of magic… yeah, the only thing this map can claim with World War I is trenches and thick mud, which you can also find at the roadworks they have outside my front door, though that doesn't stop it from following the zombie map tradition a little more closely. That tradition of executing something wildly different from the rest of the pack for their last Zombies map. Deriser was about method of transport and polish. Moon was about space. Origins is about past and future. Each of those three had a wild contrast with their other maps, but the contrast Origins has with its previous maps isn't as wild. Throughout Black Ops 2, we went to the goddamned end of the world, saw Alcatraz through a hellish lens, and stepped sideways in time to visit an underground Wild West. Going from that chaos to a World War 1-ish map doesn't feel like a big climax, yet it does try to present itself that way, with the Shinonuma crew we haven't seen since Moon returning, and having giant robots sure demonstrates the amount of work put into the map. The map is quite big and at times quite cryptic, with above ground being memorable, but containing some areas that are vague in their existence. From what I've read, there's magical staffs that can be obtained, and pieces of which I did obtain, but it's not much of a requirement to fully enjoy the map. It is much more story heavy, with our character having exchanges with the omnipresent Samantha, whom we saw on the moon, and her talking about major elements that are within the zombie lore can be heard. You see, I did previously mention a major sequence of events on the moon, but what I didn't tell you is that the easter eggs are all part of a larger story, featuring multiple groups, time loops, dimensions beyond our comprehension, and all sorts that'll have your head spinning trying to comprehend it, and will only get more confusing as we go into Black Ops 3. However, I'm here to talk about the map, and it's a pretty decent map in itself. It presents a nice challenge, the layout is simple to understand, and like every other map in this pack, it is a treat to look at. 
even more impressive since they were likely pushing the 7th generation hardware to its limit at this point. My first time going through the trenches was genuinely unnerving, thanks to zombies seeming to appear from anywhere feasible. The giant robots present a layer of dynamism that's nicely telegraphed through the use of nearby flashing red lights, and if you stand under their boots, you understandably die. The two things you need to understand when going into this level are that you are going to need a shovel and that you need to activate these generators. Pack-a-Punch isn't as easy to get to in comparison to Buried and Die Rise, but it is akin to Mob of the Dead in that you need to complete a fairly simple task activate the generators. Electricity works differently in this map. Instead of a universal switch, you have to stand guard on a generator as it starts to power up, attracting paladin zombies in the process. Like with a lot of previous zombie maps, it does a fairly good job at tutorialising this, by simply having the quick revive machine next to a generator. Good stuff, and done through environmental design, so bonus points for that. And speaking of perks, there's a new core way of getting them. We've had a lot of perks introduced over the past few maps, and Origins has several recognisable ones available like Juggernog and Quick Revive, but now you can get them at a heavily discounted price. Der Wonderfizz is essentially the random weapon box but for perk drinks, and every drink costs 1500 points. The catch is that you are limited to 4 unless you dig a lot and the drink is random, so of course you're going to end up with plenty of PhD floppers and electric cherries, with the flopper practically doing nothing, and a bit like the random box, it'll vanish after a few purchases and will be functional elsewhere. There's also a tank that you'll likely not use except for the one or two times you just really want to be entertained by it. Don't know why I had to bring it up, just a careful observation. So, why do I sorely hate this map? It's not because of the De Wonderfizz constantly giving me flopper and electric, in fact I really like that because it adds another layer of dynamism, and I can really see people having a blast acquiring perks using only De Wonderfizz, since the gaming community is known for enjoying things with bizarre handicaps. No, the reason why I hate this map is because of literally one enemy. Remember when I said that Ascension immediately became a bit stressful when the monkeys arrived? At least there was a strategy you could use to minimise their damage. In Origins, the special enemy who appears alongside the zombies is just a pain with no quick way around him. This guy, the tank soldier or panzer soldant, takes a lot of damage, deals a lot of damage and disorients your vision. Oh, and he has a grappling hook so if he manages to hit you, you better shoot the red light quick because zombies can still attack you. It is a chore to deal with him but fortunately the best tactic is to run away and sway from side to side. Even so, his presence is just really, really annoying and can take away any entertainment value this map has. I liked this map, but the Panzer Soldant's presence left me feeling really, really cold to the point that I didn't want to return to this map. It's got almost everything right, but the one thing that seemed like a distant worry ended up being the iceberg that sank the Titanic. Am I nitpicking? Maybe, but if I'm not having an entertaining time, I'm going to nitpick as entertainment. Black Ops 2 Zombies ended up being a bunch of odd ducks. Buried and Mob of the Dead ended up being some of my favourite maps to play so far, but the rest of the maps were either mediocre or a drag, with the exception of the individual green run maps. This was the last game Treyarch made for the 7th generation, and with the 8th generation on the horizon, it opened up new opportunities for the mode. For a start, Treyarch decided not to be relatively grounded as it had… sort of… been. I mean, sure, we've been for a treasure hunt on the moon, yet this is where the mode gets… weird. I have a very soft spot in my heart for Black Ops 3. I thoroughly enjoyed the single player, I've spent countless hours on multiplayer, and the package as a whole is arguably the best. 
from single player, multiplayer, zombies, zombie single player variant, customizable options including guns and knives, unlockables for single player and zombies, all the way to a theatre mode available for both multiplayer and zombies. It was one of the most entertaining games I played in 2015 and still remains one of the most entertaining games I've ever played even if the main villain is a computer virus that infects the human brain. If you need any further evidence of my love for this game, the coalescent startup sound is the little jingle in my intro card. So let's get the important thing out of the way. Yes, you can play this game offline, no internet connection needed, and you can play zombie solo without the game treating it like a multiplayer lobby. Simply select solo play, and that's it. The benefit of being offline is that every single weapon unlock is available to you without any hours of play, but surprisingly, I recommend you play the game online precisely to get these unlocks. It sounds weird, but there's something inherently satisfying about unlocking even the most mundane of paint jobs and levelling up your weapon. Scrolling through the post-game unlocks is oddly satisfying. Another feature added is the Gobble Gum, which is a selection of power-ups you can customise before going into each game. There's two types, Classic and Mega. Classic gums can vary in usefulness, like having your ammo be taken from your stockpile instead of your clip, eliminating the need to reload or you can potentially overpower yourself by picking a single-use Mega Gumball that can make the game substantially easier. One of them is you are given every perk your current map has. At that point, you won't have to worry about getting into much hassle ever again. I did say they are single-use, and the way you can get more is by going to Dr. Monty's factory. You get a chance to get rare Gumballs by using Liquid Divinium to measure how many balls you can get per roll. You get more Divinium by playing the game, or through microtransactions, because even zombies are not safe from microtransactions. Playing solo means these balls don't cost any points unless you want to buy more than one ball per round, and these gumball machines are seemingly everywhere, even in the most remote of places. That's the mechanical differences, let's look at the maps. Black Ops 3's music composer was Jack Wall of Mass Effect fame, and he is an extremely talented composer, arguably one of the modern day greats. I mention this because Shadows of Evil may be a wonderful map to both play in and look at, but Wall's music solidifies the style of this map. There are traditional uneasy orchestral pieces, but it's not what you're going to remember. You're going to remember the jazz, the sweet, sweet jazz music that plays at the beginning and end of every round. When you die, you are also greeted with the jazz. When you go to the perk machines, their music is replaced with Jack Wall's jazz music. That, sadly, doesn't make any other appearance in Black Ops 3. Now for the boring part of this section, the last new perk. Widow's Wine. It's kind of a mixture between Electric Cherry and the concept of spider webs. If you get hit by a zombie and have grenades left, which are replaced by a special Semtex grenade, you explode and zombies around you will become covered in webbing. Throw the Semtex and it will explode and will fire webbing, which slows the zombies down and deals some damage. It's actually a really handy perk to have and becomes somewhat vital in the later rounds. Useful, but boring. As for the map itself, it is, without hyperbole, possibly the best map out of the whole mode. It's certainly the best in terms of maps shipped with the game, trumping Nacht Dern Toten, Kino Der Toten and Green Mile out of the park. The environment oozes style with visuals and especially music. There's not a single section of wasted space. It's easy to navigate yet complex in layout, and the special rounds are challenging without it being frustrating. Parasites and death balls as I like to call them, appear regularly, as well as a three-headed Lovecraftian nightmare who appears alongside the zombies. Much in the same way the Panzer Soldans in Origins did, except this guy doesn't feel like a crapshoot. As for the Pack-a-Punch, it may take some time to find, but fortunately there isn't anything convoluted or vague. Embrace the beast, and you can find some clear signposting to what you should do, and it helps that the two basic attacks are explained in the first round. I was able to find the hole in the wall that's this level's version of the Pack-a-Punch on my own and without a guide, and I credit it 
to this map's excellent polish. If I have a criticism, it's that I feel the cast is underutilised, but the layout, the aesthetic, the enemies and especially the music make this arguably the best map in the whole franchise. Another thing that was shipped with Black Ops 3 was Dead Ops Arcade 2, which was something I was not expecting and, well, there's something off about it. The controls feel a little clunky, the camera looks like it was zoomed in way too close, and the default weapon sounds weak. One of the power-ups you can get switches the camera to first person, which is neat in concept, but the more tense music just makes it feel more out of place. The plot of the level is Gorilla Sun hates you, Gorilla Sun kidnaps your chicken, go after him. It's just dead ops from black ops but controls worse, so let's move on. Fun story, I was supposed to study German at secondary school, but my mother thought that both the difficulty of the language and its limited use would be a struggle. I had a lot of listening and communication problems that haven't really subsided. It's funny now because I've been to German speaking countries more times than I've been to France. I'm saying this now because Der Eisendrack is a pretty good map that I'll constantly struggle to pronounce, so for most of the time I'll just call it the Iron Dragon, the English translation. Minor thing before I get started properly, and it's a very weird quirk. The Iron Dragon is the only new map in Black Ops 3 to have this sort of art style for an intro. It was used in Die Rise and Buried, and they were neat, and I kind of miss it. It gives the weird events like the four heroes chasing after one of their frozen parallel cells while riding on one of the giant Origins robots an almost comical vibe. In fact, I've not really talked about the overall story of the zombies mode, and it's because it's something that can be easily ignored, but the Black Ops 3 maps have occasional prods to a larger overall plot throughout some of the earlier rounds. The Shadow Man's presence in Shadows of Evil serves that purpose, and the characters will spout exposition or share dialogue with an omnipresent NPC. Good luck trying to figure out the plot because it feels like it's getting written on the fly. Mob of the Dead, in terms of story, takes place in a parallel afterlife where three of the mobsters are stuck in a cycle after killing the fourth guy in the real world and their death by electric chair sends them instead into this parallel hell prison and... Ah! All you need to know about the story is that it's there. It's not normally the centerpiece, even if Moon felt like it was constructed around the easter egg to its detriment. It's a bit more present now, but understanding it isn't required to enjoy zombies, especially since at times it feels like we're missing out on a lot of character chemistry. If you want to follow story events, have fun following the wiki's instructions, because in-game, it's extremely vague. I didn't make that Mob of the Dead connection randomly, because this map has its own interpretation of the wolves. In this map, it's dragons, and they work the same way as they did before. Feed three dragons to satisfactory levels, gain a weapon of otherworldly properties. Except the Wrath of the Ancients bow is actually really useful, and not some frustrating panic button. The map itself is a nice little maze that has a De Riser sort of concept, in that the map has a focus on teleportation and having alternative routes open up once the power gets turned on. I say teleportation, it's actually one teleporter and a lot of jump pads. There's a lot more focus on polish and less emphasis on trying new things here. They've lessened the number of drinks machines, so you get the four basic perks, stamina up and mule kick in this ridiculously large map. And if you want any of the others, give the Wonder Fizz a try. The machines are nicely spaced out in this snowy castle, heavily based on Hohenwerfen Castle in Austria, and the layout is simplistic enough that you won't get too lost. Although, after several hours, I still get confused as which path in the tomb leads to what. Not to say that there isn't a form of experimentation. In fact, this is the only map in the mode where you decide where the Pack-a-Punch machine spawns out of a choice of three locations, providing you visit the other two first. It's actually quite challenging, since you can decide to either take a quick route but leave it vulnerable to a space rocket test, into the tomb where it's hard to track precisely where the zombies are spawning, or the long way around which can allow easy access to the machine. They also brought back the Hellhounds, whom we haven't seen since we took a trip to the moon. In fact, it's a little surprise in that, despite being an incredibly well-known element of the mode, that they've had so few appearances. 
Sadly, this will be the last time we see our wonderful hounds, and they behave like they did in Shinonuma. No patrol mode, just immediately start charging towards you. Bit of an odd backtrack, but it's not egregious. What could have been egregious is the Panzer Soldant. Yeah, these guys are back after arguably following you riding on that giant robot, and it seems they've done a bit of upgrading to our benefit. What I hated about the Panzer Soldant in Origins was that it was an enemy type that demanded you constantly run, despite being in a map made out of tough mud. Not only does the lack of an environmental slowdown help make this enemy much more tolerable, but they actually replaced the worst part of the Soldant. The grappling hook is now gone, instead replaced with electrical stun grenades, and I think it's great. The grappling hook was essentially a kiss of doom in Origins, but in the Iron Dragon, if you get stunned, 9 times out of 10 it's because it's your own fault. I won't lie, I dreaded his arrival when I saw him again, but I'm satisfied with what they've done to tame him. In fact, satisfying is how I would describe the map as a whole. Layout is good, its gimmicks aren't unwelcome, and took the time to improve on things that were not working before. It's not as good as Shadows of Evil, but that's like saying Grand Theft Auto San Andreas is not as good as Grand Theft Auto Vice City. The bar was set so high that it would have been one hell of an achievement if they topped it. I enjoyed this map. It was fun, so as far as the zombie maps in Black Ops 3 goes, the game is off to a really good start. Word of warning, this map contains spiders. A lot of spiders. The last two maps were a polished and brightly coloured extravaganza that introduced us to the mode on the next generation of hardware, so it makes sense to bring zombies back into the more dark, horror-centric roots of the genre. And what's more scary than moss-covered World War II architecture? There's something inherently spooky about wartime concrete and old technology bunkers. It's one of those things that feels haunted by days of not-too-distant past. It hasn't been a hundred years since the war, so presenting the period in an uneasy tone strikes an emotional chord for those who have looked into the most destructive war in history. Zetsubao no Shima takes such a structure, loads it with the weird technology that has been present throughout most of the mode, and combines it with natural horrors we, as humans, are uneasy with. This map is beautiful to look at, the moss makes it distinct from the others, and the tone change from pulp, campy action to something between alien and aliens allow for some effective horror. I remember opening the double doors into the bunker vividly, just that confrontation followed by the reveal of the Thrashers. They're a bit like the Marguas from Shadows of Evil, except it has universal health, but it can be killed faster with accuracy in three specific spots on their body. Okay, it's not really like the Marguas, but it adds a layer of dynamism akin to the Panzer Soldant. Once again, the map is based a bit more on polish, but it does add some quirks that are welcome, and... Also a bit odd. You're introduced to the bucket of radiated water quite quickly, but it took a bit of time for me to realise that you need to fill a bucket to water the plants. This bit of gardening then unlocks the big doors. This isn't the end of odd decisions, as the game introduces us to... More gardening. No joke, you get seeds from zombies, plant them in the ground, water them, and you might get something from them. Sometimes it's useless, but sometimes it's incredibly handy, especially when the resulting plants can attract a large swarm of zombies. Sadly, it does feel like the plants come at random, and I'm sure there's a guide to it, but if I have to look at a guide to understand core features, then it's not doing something I consider a positive. What is positive are the skulls you can collect and cleanse, much in the same way Shadows of Evil's sacrifices did, this time earning you the skull of Nan Sapwe instead of the Pack-a-Punch, a weapon which is, without a doubt, the most overpowered weapon in the entire game. It has two modes, one makes you invisible to traverse past the zombies, or the much more entertaining option, which can potentially wipe out a battalion of zombies in sight. 
The weakest part of the map has to be the Pack-a-Punch machine. It works in the same way Mob of the Dead does, in that you have to get objects and apply it to a mechanical device. You only need three of them, and they're all in the bunker, which isn't too big. But you won't find them. At best you'll find the metal bar, since it's in the same pool of water you need to dive in to activate the power proper. The other two feel like adventure game logic. One of them is in the flooded mine next to the mule kick machine, which could take time to find thanks to the lighting engine, and the other is stored in one of the hanging webbed zombies. I didn't know you needed to knife these white hanging bags to get access to the Pack-a-Punch machine. I thought it was on a desk or maybe in a corner somewhere, not completely concealed from sight. I actually had to use a guide to find it, and it still confuses me on how Treyarch expected us to interact with the environment. After getting the Pack-a-Punch and you start wandering around, one thing becomes clear. The map design isn't all that great. Visually it's fantastic, but in terms of layout it feels a bit basic. The elevated labs add something, but the exterior feels like a moss-covered Shangri-La, and the interior feels like a much better lower floor 5. Also, I got confused at the start in regards to the vital quick revive, to the point that I originally thought there was an afterlife mechanic like Mob of the Dead. Pro tip, the quick revive will drop into the area you first unlock. So what about those spiders I teased about before? Well, I did say that the Iron Dragon would be the last time we see the Hellhounds, and every single map in Black Ops 3 has its own unique round enemy. Zetsubao no Shima has giant spiders which is cliche, but they have unique properties. They spin webs across doorways and jam gobblegum and Coca-Cola machines. But they're really underwhelming when you consider the last few maps had some really unique enemies. If you spend some time assembling the KT-4, which requires you to swim down the flooded shaft whose only purpose is to host one of the ingredients to craft it, you can dissolve a giant spider web and face Shelob. I'm almost disappointed that the unique enemy isn't the Japanese spider crab, so no giant enemy crab jokes for me. As much as I enjoyed my time on this map, when you've done the skull cleansing and killed the giant spider, there doesn't seem to be much more to it. I can replay a lot of these maps and still find enjoyment, but Zetsubao lacks that feeling and I'm not too sure why. It could be the more simple layout since outside watering the plants and capturing a spider to get a vial of venom, there isn't any real reason to return there for the purposes of zombie killing. I did like this map but it feels a little shallow, and getting to the Pack-a-Punch is a little tedious and vague. Also, spiders. Could have thought of a more imaginative enemy guys. Quick translation lesson. Der Eisendrak means the Iron Dragon, Zetsubao no Shima means Island of Despair, and Gorod Krovi means City of Blood. Makes sense, since Gorod Krovi is set in an alternative universe Stalingrad. So why was Der Eisendrak named the Iron Dragon? Is it because of these dragons that eat the dead zombies? Well, maybe I can give you that, but look at this map! It's full of dragons! Look at all the goddamn dragons! Why did dragon get used in the Winter Castle map and not in the city full of fucking dragons? There's a dead one at the starting zone and they're flying all over the place! Right, dragon related issues aside, if you're looking for something vaguely Stalingrad in this zombies map, then Gorod Krovi is not it. It might be because there's something tonally clashing between the campy cartoon antics of the mode and one of the deadliest single battles in history in which about a million and a half people died, or it could be that Treyarch did Stalingrad far, far better before. Stalingrad aside, this map's central theme is dragons. They're everywhere. They come down and breathe fire on you and the zombies. Everything is on fire. You can have a little dragon companion, though that presents its own problems, and you can command a dragon in the sky. There are little pieces of Gorod Krovi that make this map stand out stylistically, and it is arguably the most fantastical map at this point. And yet, I don't like this map. Like, I really don't like it. And I can narrow it down to three factors. One, the technology is really inconsistent. 
I don't know what the cause of it is, but it's forced me to turn off the multiplayer mode via Steam because of some clashing file structures or something, but this game does stutter, most notably in the lead up to the Dragon Command Center, which you will use frequently. Sometimes the frame rate goes lower than that, and I also got this weird error that ended up corrupting a good portion of my footage. Second is the road to the Pack-a-Punch machine. Once again, it's simple to get the gist of. You collect a code cylinder that has to be used on one of three different computers, located at the Dragon Command Center, Tank Factory, and Supply Depot. When activated, a drop pod appears from the sky, and you have to go and defend it wherever it lands. Defend it long enough, and it opens up to give you a component. Do it two more times, so far so good. Here is where the initial confusion sets in. If you are someone like me, you'd take those components back to the Dragon Command Center and fiddle around with this complicated looking computer layout. But no, you have to go to this dark room and place them on the machine that requires them. It's not an issue after the first time you do it, but this room doesn't exactly scream, insert vital parts here. It's a minor complaint, especially when you consider my third point of contention. Remember when I said you could command a dragon and have a nice little companion who acts as a little sentry? Well, those neat things come after going through one of the most ridiculous processes I have ever slogged through. So, after inserting the components, you can ride the dragon to the Pack-a-Punch machine, and on the first floor, you see this lovely device. Out of curiosity, you touch it, and start to endure one of the most stressful trials I have encountered on this mode. Simple objective, survive. Doesn't sound too difficult until you realise that the zombies you kill don't grant points, armoured boys climb in and join the slaughter, and you have no way to escape. This small house is so small too, it's smaller and narrower than knacked down Toten, and you have to go through four little rounds of this. I thought I had to activate something to reactivate a defense mechanism or something, since Pack-a-Punch was locked out when I arrived. But no, you can get Pack-a-Punch when you arrive at the little warehouse, and it only gets locked out if you touch the glowing medallion, which is likely the first thing you see here. So of course you're going to touch it, because it looks significant. It tells you to press F. This is not a challenge, it's an endurance test. I failed three times before I gave up and activated God Mode. I really don't care. If you complete the test, congrats, you are free to go, and you are free to use the Dragon Strike. It's fun to use, so why restrict it behind something that isn't optimized for single player? It gets worse when getting a Dragon Companion. Good news is that it's not as irritating, just time consuming. Find the egg, which is in a place that's normally out of your peripheral vision, heat up the egg, kill different types of zombies in different ways, return the egg to the Pack-a-Punch warehouse, and essentially kill zombies the same way you killed them for their souls on the moon. Take the egg back to the start, and you have a dragon companion. It took me quite a bit of time to complete this with God Mode, and that is a shame because the companion and the dragon breath are neat features that are shamefully entertaining to use but it's locked behind unoptimized challenges that prevent me from returning. I could get into the absurdity of this particular easter egg, which includes using adventure game logic to retrieve a vital object, or needing to shoot a code in a computer. There's also the special round which introduces the Valkyrie taunt, but their initial surprise wears thin very quickly. It's an inoffensive map, but there's so many little things I really don't like about this map, both structurally and creatively. Black Ops 3 had a great run of maps so far, issues aside, and in comparison, Gorod Krovi is just not that well thought out. Like I said, I really don't like this map, so let's move on. The Simpsons wasn't always great in its prime. There were a couple of episodes that didn't hit the mark, and a few of them included the much maligned clip shows. I decided to rewatch one of these, and aside from the jarring shift in animation and audio quality when using past episodes, 
The interesting thing is that they tried to string a connecting element using the clips. I say this because if a clip show had a Call of Duty Zombies equivalent, Revelations is it, with the connecting element being that the Shadow Man is breaking realities apart. It's a walking tour of most of the past maps, and the shortcuts are portals to a slightly redesigned Nacht der Untoten. Look, it's Mob of the Dead and Kino der Toten! Remember these maps? There's Verrockt and... De Eisendrack? Oh, hey Shangri-La, what's up? Remember the trenches on Origins? Oh, amazing! There are exactly two central areas of the map that aren't completely recycled from elsewhere. The starting area, and what the game calls the Apothecon, and the returning areas are cut up into smaller chunks with a ritual site added in, so that there was a connecting element in between them. But despite the more recycled nature of this map, to the point that I can confidently say that about 60 to 70% of the map is recycled, as is the point of a clip show, I kind of unironically like this map. I liked it a lot more than God Crovey, since it runs consistently and had a more tolerable execution. Two reasons why I like this map. Number one, aside from Nacht and Eisendrak, the map seems to be focused on redesigning the reused content. I mean, clearly this is Kino, I can recognise the theatre and teleporter anywhere, but its reconstruction adds a fresh sense of tension to the environment. Previously the main hall was a thin strip with a stage, but now it's allowed itself to open up while not making the player feel completely safe. It's more or less emulating the tone while adding a fresh spin to the maps. Number two, that tone presents a wonderful feeling of nostalgia. It truly is a greatest hits compilation. Even if Activision was possibly pulling some financial strings, this was the game released after the Call of Duty dominance waned, and if that's the case, then... Really Activision? Zombies is all I come back for. Even if you originally anticipated doing a clip show of the adventures of Dempsey, Nikolai, Takio and Richtofen, then why haven't you included Ascension? There's two types of clip show, one that pads out the season for budgetary reasons, and one that puts an interesting spin on past content. To put it this way, I've spent the most amount of recording time within Black Ops 3 on this level, and I don't have a past with this map. I stopped buying map packs after buying the base game to get my studies done, and what was recorded was all I played. The map was easy to navigate, the road to the Pack-a-Punch was easy to traverse, with the opening moments being really impressive impressive, and it's a beautiful map to look at. Several enemies return as a callback, like the Parasites and Marguas, while introducing a new special enemy that has a fairly unnerving introduction. This creature's interior is as unpleasant as its exterior. You know... Before I dived headfirst into the mode in its entirety, when I was conceiving the idea of replaying all the zombies maps from beginning to end, I had a worry at the back of my head that it would end up like rewatching The Simpsons. Cool start, amazing heights, before descending into mediocrity with the occasional good episode. But replaying these levels solo has been a real delight. At times it was frustrating, but my entire journey from beginning to end was without a doubt a net positive. And it gets better. About a year after Revelations was released, Treyarch released Zombies Chronicles for Black Ops 3, all while Infinite Warfare was dominating the series' attention. You got the remaining World at War maps, since fan favourite Deriser was released as a season pass extra called The Giant, and the vast amount of maps return here. Kino, Ascension, Shangri-La and Moon are also included, and each of them comes with the DeWonderfizz machine, giving you the option to to completely break your round record from the original releases. There are maps that I like that are unfortunately missing, like Five and Call of the Dead. I can speculate that it might be due to rights reasons, since it's possible they don't want to release Five without Eminem and Pink shouting, and there might be issues with any of the big actors that appeared in Call of the Dead. Not Danny Trejo, he'll do anything for 50 bucks. But that's not all. I am of the complete thought that Black Ops 3 is the best package out of all the Call of Duties, and the reason includes customization options, 
theatre mode and the potential for endless zombies maps. You see, Black Ops 3 has mod support, as in it has Steam Workshop enabled. Treyarch released the tools to create your own maps, for both multiplayer and zombies, and when I heard the news that it arrived, I was almost gobsmacked. It means a dedicated community can keep this mode going, even if the servers decide to turn off, and I found some neat maps, like Kayasuru for example, a nice map with some neat twists and turns, and with a good focus on elevation. The architecture scattered around is also pretty cool, and uh, wait, hey, wait a minute, I know this map! That's Castle from World at War! I guess after going through the remake phase of this feature, we could see some more fantastic maps from the community. So, now the question is, where does this potentially lead us? What can we learn from the maps of past zombie levels, and what picture does that paint for Black Ops 4? I played the game solo because I wanted to revisit the maps at my own pace, and question if potentially getting rid of such a method of playing is a bad idea. It was Rocky playing it solo to start with, but it's clear that Treyarch can make a map suitable for those that want to go it alone. Sometimes it doesn't pay off, like God Crovey and the original Origins release, and sometimes it can be downright disastrous, like Nuketown and One Element of Die Rise. But most of the time, Treyarch do well in making this game suitable solo. But there's also a concern about what they can do to spin the formula. I admit I was running out of things to say as I go on, and that's because any gameplay element that is in a later map, both mechanically and through level design, could also be applied to many maps before, to the point that I'd sound like a broken record. I've seen the three announcement trailers, and it looks like the core releases will be Voyage of the Damned, a challenge mode could be the Colosseum, and the zombie killing boy band will have an adventure in Mob of the Dead. I can recognise that background any day, and that was before they 100% confirmed it. Overall, we should be safe in regards to Treyarch letting us play the maps on our own, and with no bots should an option be available. Their base release map from Black Ops onward are guaranteed to give us a good time in some form, and post releases are normally pretty good. If you want my advice in terms of getting into the mode on PC, since Activision aren't exactly the most generous of people, I'd say you'd be best getting Black Ops 3 with the Zombie Chronicles DLC. You'll get the World at War maps, plus a good chunk of Black Ops maps, and you'll have access to potentially much, much more without having to spend another penny. We can only wait and see how Black Ops 4 does in terms of zombies, but after playing every single map, I can safely say that I am very optimistic.